I was trying to decide if I was going to do the father thing or not, but I'm not. All right. And welcome. I'm sorry we're a little bit late. We have, we're taking care of a couple of things church business-wise. You, 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 I'm on time sometimes going, Siri, 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 and she don't answer. Here I am, something's going on, and she, I can't find that. I'm not talking to you. All right, but welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church. Thank you for being with us as we continue ministering the Word of God. I want to uh, invite you to uh, go to our Facebook page, Expedition Church, and um, check out all of our calendar of events uh, for, the, for the year. We have... Um, listed everything out there except guest speakers and we're working on those but uh, most of all of our events are out there so, so far and you can avail yourself to that we'd love to have you come join us over here at Expedition Church of the Triad in Pleasant Garden praise God uh, everybody let's go ahead and continue we started last week on decisions remember we talked about how that you know we're, we're, we're segueing into previous teaching you know, we, we're not doing stand, that what we've been doing so far this year. We haven't been doing standalone teaching. In other words, you know, a message on you can have what you say or a message on, you know, what to do in a, for an overnight stay in the lion's den or um, th that was a book back. You know, it's a little mini book years and your by Glassford. I believe, I believe uh, Greg Glassford did that. Um, you know. It's great. It's great sermon title. I never preached. I do need to preach that. I could just off the sermon title. You can get a sermon. You know, the do's and don'ts for an overnight stay in the lion's den. Um, you know, which are great to have. You know, um, sermons that are we call a standalone. They're not. But what we've been doing so far is we've been preaching on things like confession, um, the importance of the Word of God, the value of it, and each thing is is connecting to what we've been teaching. And so decisions connects to that. Your decisions in life, amen? And so uh, we'll read Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20 again. And uh, that is, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that thou, both thou and thy seed may live. Isn't that good to know? That if you choose life, <laughs> I mean, that ought to be like a, wow, I had a, had a V8 moment. Don't you think? You know, if you choose life, you'll live. Uh, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now, when you ever see uh, the phraseology, um, to give it, you know, God, when God refers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is a covenant reference. Okay? It's a covenant reference. So we're looking at this as covenant relationship based on a covenant. God's doing this because he's in covenant with us. Glory to God. Aren't you glad he's in covenant with you? Okay, two of you are. What about the rest of you? I hope you're glad he's in covenant with you because I'm glad he's in covenant with me. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So this, this covenant relationship that if you will um, choose life, amen, and obey him, then he's going to give you length of days, amen, and that you dwell in the land which the Lord gives, gave unto thy fathers. Hallelujah. Now, um, we kind of got, got hung there last week and didn't get past that. And I was going to move into, but we got so far over on a different direction last week, um, it was unrecoverable, so to speak, as to whether or not we could come back and pick up on it. Uh, in that service, and we we couldn't. So let's let's take up that God gave us the right to choose. That's, that's our first point: is God gave us the right to choose. Now, uh, kind of like um, Indiana Jones and the um, what, what the what's the one with the crucible in it? The Last Crusade. Yeah, you know, choose wisely. <laughs> you know, when you, of the cups and the chalices, choose wisely. Um, God says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because there's going be, to be blessings attached to choosing life. Now, by implication, there's going, not going to be life. There's going to be destruction. There's going to be misery by choosing 
the course of evil. All right? Now, so we, 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 we kind of left off there last week and didn't get into this next point, which was uh, numerous Bible characters made the wrong decision. And we talked about this so far this year, that the idea that you got one shot at it, okay, you missed that one shot and you're toast. Now, Richard Roberts came out, oh, back in the 80s, preaching, you know, he's the God of the second chance, okay? And, um, and it, was, it was a great message, you know, it was a great sermon. Uh, I preached it a lot. He's the God of the second chance. There is opportunity for restoration with God. Amen? We even see that in Paul. When, when judgment was brought, remember, uh, when you come together, I'll be with you in spirit. For, you know, I've heard, I've heard, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, I've heard of things among, uh, that are going on among you that aren't, even, that aren't even heard of among the Gentiles. And he says this, that a man should have his father's wife. That guy shacked up with his stepmama and come into church like it's okay. And Paul said, I'll be with you in the spirit. And I've judged already. Then when everybody shows up, I'm going to be there in spirit and bind him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So even in that judgment, the purpose was restoration. Amen. But we've preached so much judgment, particularly in Pentecostal circles. Okay. Now, I, I grew up classical Pentecostal. I, I know leaving church with the smell of fire and brimstone on your clothes and your shoes melted from the heat coming up, from the, the flames of hell coming up during the sermon because they were cooking you. You know, they read that sermon too many times. It centers in the hand of an angry God that caused the great awakening. <laughs> Everybody was running to the altars. Yeah, well, and, and you know, you get that kind of message, you will. But it lasts one generation. If you scare me and it doesn't hold over. Okay. Bible characters missed it, but still had restoration. Now we know, and if we go back to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. But God made provision to cover their sin. Amen. Um, let's run over to talk about Saul. First Samuel 15. Now I'm going to tell you something. Saul was a, he was the Peter of the Old Testament. Okay. His flesh got him in more trouble. All right. I mean, Saul lost his kingdom eventually. And, um, Right now, we're going, to, we're going to major on the fact that Bible characters missed it. They, they made the wrong decisions. And it can be costly. Adam's sin cost his estate with God and put man in spiritual darkness. Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, now remember, they were to go out and kill and wipe out the enemy, wipe out their cattle, wipe out their herds, and bring nothing back. And, Sam, and, so, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to, be, to obey is better than sacrifice and hearken than the fifth, uh, um, fat of rams. I'm sorry. Fat of rams, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Now, what happened was Samuel shows up after the battle. And he comes, comes up and hears a bunch of sheep bleeping. And he goes to Saul to find out what happened. He said, I've done what the Lord told me to do. You know, we, we did this, we did that. He said, what is that bleating in, I hear in my ears? Well, we saved that enough to sacrifice to the Lord. What it was, leaders of the armies and stuff wanted to, keep the, wanted to get rich. And so he he wimpied out on them 
instead of obeying God. He wimped, he wimped out and gave in and didn't obey God. So the prophet shows up. You got to think these kings were uptight when the prophets showed up. Especially when they knew they did something wrong. Okay? And uh, it cost him his, his kingdom. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. We can't, we can't fear man and disobey God. And that's what's going on in the world today. They want the church to fear the reprisal of men instead of obeying God. So now we allow things into our churches that God would never allow in our churches. Amen. Uh, I think I'm going to stand back up. Hallelujah. All right. Glory. Um, the fear of man will cause you to do things you shouldn't do. Hello. We can't fear man. We have to obey God. No matter what we think it's going to cost us, it will not cost you nearly as much as disobeying God. Give me two holy grunts, one amen, or a help me Jesus and give me the church finger as you walk out. Okay. Now, it's not giving you the finger, the church finger is one finger up as you hold your head down. I'm leaving, you know. It's, it's, a sign, it's supposed to be a sign of respect, you know. Yeah, I got to go, you know. Um, now, that lady came in the other day that, that came in. We couldn't get her to stay. Um, she didn't give us any kind of finger. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Which I'm glad she, you know, if you want to go do anything, just don't do anything, right? Um, now, therefore, I pray, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. It cost him his kingdom. Okay? Now, let's go to chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel. Now, that, that's, that's going to be the reference. I'm not going to read all this. Okay? But let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Obviously, I'm not going to read two chapters. Okay. This is probably one of the most uh, poignant examples of this that uh, you can find of um, God, uh, of, of disobeying God and it costing. But then also here it gives you the opportunity to see the restorative power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All righty. One more time I'm sharing this. I got, I got booted out, and I was trying to get it out there, make sure people know we're here. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. All right. Now, what, is it? what time is it? <laughs> now, I don't know what was going on in that era, but apparently there was a time of year they went to battle. Okay. I mean, I don't think it was a Super Bowl because people were getting killed. But there was a time when they went, when they went to battle. And um, when, now who, now who went? Kings. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the chain, uh, children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David tarried at Jerusalem. Now stop. Let me ask you a question. Where's David supposed to be? He's supposed to be out there with the people, the men, fighting. Right? Isn't that right? The kings went forth to battle. He sent somebody, he sent somebody in his place. I'm staying behind. Next verse. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose off of, from off of his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. You think there might be a reason he stayed behind in Jerusalem? Huh? You don't think rumors were out? The men leave the city. The women go up and, and, and strip and take baths on the roof. Let's just say it this way. Butt naked. Hello? 
They're up there taking a bath naked. <laughs> it's probably the best way to take a bath. <coughs> I can't imagine, you know, taking a woman with your clothes on. All right? Um, and it came to be that um, David sent and inquired a bath to the woman. And one said, is it not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Now, we all know what all this means, right? He's king. She has no authority to reject his advances for fear of being killed. I mean, you know, that, that's the way the you know, king was king. And so uh, they had relations. Well, they had relations. Hello. And then he sent her home. Bad boy. Okay. And uh, the woman conceived. Okay. That's great. One night. And she gets pregnant. Beware lest your sins find you out. Nowadays, with the, with, with, I mean, a, a well-known preacher, and he's, he, his, his church is completely blown out of the water because after this event, he, he got into some other stuff. And, you know, I tell you, when you start making decisions and going down certain paths, it ends up costing you in the long run if you don't turn around and get it right. Uh, he got a woman pregnant. He was anti-abortion, preached about it all the time in his pulpit, and she had an abortion. Because it was going to destroy his ministry if it got out that he had had an affair. Yeah, and he paid for her to have the abortion. He, he tried to do a cover-up. Well, he got found out. Well, that, that didn't work real good. And sent and told David and said, I am with child. <laughs> Problem. Uriah is out at battle where the king is supposed to be. And there ain't nobody behind. Usually in those days, the, the, the male keepers of the palace and stuff were eunuchs. There won't anybody left behind to get her pregnant. Except the king. So it ain't going to take the people long to figure out Remember that song? Papa was a rolling stone. <laughs> David was a rolling stone. Some of y'all remember that song? Temptations? Okay. Yeah. All right. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And he sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come to David, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. Well, if you were there, you wouldn't have to ask. And David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said to Uriah, comest thou not from thy journey? Why didst thou not go unto thine own house? And Uriah said unto David, thy, uh, the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest and as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. Great. He gets the boy scout of the century. Mm -hmm. Mr. Honorable. I mean, when you're going to have a cover up, you don't need Mr. Honorable in the middle of this thing. <laughs> are you here? I mean, you know, we're talking like major Boy Scout. It's dishonorable for me to go in the, to sleep in my house, to lie with my wife, to eat at her ta at our table while my brethren are out there and in in, in sleeping in fields and eating whatever they can get a hold of and, uh, you know, in battle. I'm not going to do that. Okay. And David says, okay, plan B. David said to Uriah, Terry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah uh, arose, arose, abode, I'm sorry, uh, in Jerusalem this, that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. Okay, now, get him drunk. Okay. 
Hallelujah. And that evening he went up to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but he went not down to his house. This guy ain't drunk. This guy is drunk, but he ain't drunk enough to know that he's still honorable. Um, and it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. <coughs> and he wrote in the letter saying, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab reserved the city um, that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. And then Joab sent to David all things concerning the war, charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the mat matters of the war unto the king, and if it so be the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they... they that would shoot from the wall and smote Abimelech and the son of uh, Jerubasheth. Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall and he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh to the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger came, went and came and showed David all the things that Joab sent him. And surely, the, and the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us, came out into the field, and we were upon the, them even unto the entering of the gate, and the shooter shot from the wall. And the David said, Did thou, um, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. I'm skipping a little bit there. For the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it. And he encouraged him. Now stop. So David's now justifying conspiracy to commit murder and murder by saying, well, somebody was going to die anyway. So he is, he's, he's the, now listen, this is all decisions. Why? Verse 1 of chapter 11. David tarried at Jerusalem when the kings went forth to battle. He made a decision to stay behind. Now, we don't know. I, I suspect as he heard what was going on with the, the rooftops, okay, and uh, he's just going to check it out himself. And then, you know, you, listen, your flesh will get you to check out stuff and get you in trouble. All right? And um, when the wife of Uriah heard that her, her, Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David done had David had done displeased the Lord. I think, you think, that displeased the Lord? You're a king, okay? Now, David, cover-up's complete. Uriah's dead, so nobody can, you know. And see, what David wanted was this. One of the Uriah go into the house, and if he all he did was sleep at the house, and hopefully would have relations with his wife, that she would just have a premature baby, and nobody would think twice about it. And when she got pregnant, had a baby prematurely, and she would just be Uriah's. It would be Uriah's baby, Uriah and um, Bathsheba's baby. Great, David's in the clear. Uriah didn't didn't go along with the plan. Not unknowing to him, no unknowingly to himself, he was endangering his own life by not going along with the plan. Okay? So David then goes, well, he, you know, he conspires this. He says, he's in conspiracy. See, when you make the wrong decision, you can either straighten it out then, or if you try to cover it up, it's just going to escalate and get worse. Because it went from adultery and uh, adultery and getting her pregnant to then a, a conspiracy to cover up. Now he's in a cover up that didn't work. Now he goes, it enters into a conspiracy to commit murder. And ultimately he didn't kill Uriah, but he killed Uriah. Okay. I mean, it's like pushing somebody in front of a moving, a car going 55 miles an hour. You didn't kill them. The car did, but you, you, you killed them. You pushed them in front of it. Okay, but so now David, Uriah's dead. She's mourned. He's brought her to himself. He's married her. Nobody in Jerusalem, and they can hide the baby in the cast, the, the, the palace for ever how long they need to hide it, so nobody can put add go to the um, addition tables. Figure out when that baby was born, and why was it born? You know, at this point in time, da 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 da. There's, you know, that they can they there. That's enough sec security and secretiveness there. They can hide it. So David's kind of going along. Well, okay. 
got away with this. And, you, know, you know, he probably would have gotten killed in battle anyway. You know, so I, I really didn't do anything wrong because, you know, he, it, it's very likely he would have gotten killed. Except it displeased the Lord. Now, don't tell me you're under grace and God don't care. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. Now, Nathan's the prophet. That's my son's name came from, by the way. And he came unto him and said unto him, now listen, the one person that could come into the king uh, was the prophet. Because the, the kings feared the Lord. And they knew enough about the prophets, they didn't mess with them. Okay? There were two men in one city, one rich and one poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. And, um, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. In other words, they loved, it was a pet, okay? They loved that lamb. It was a pet. It was a family pet, okay? And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come. So he, he goes over there and kills, grabs the guy's lamb. Why? He's got, he, the man can't do anything about it. Takes the guy's one lamb, that's the family pet, and slays it and feeds the traveler. He's got herds. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, that man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because he had no pity. And David, Nathan said unto David, you be the man. And King James says, thou art the man. You be the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king of Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if he had been, if it had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such things, such and such things. <clears throat> Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, that thou hast killed, that thou hast killed? Uriah the Hittite with the sword, taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against the, the, thine own, out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives from before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For, did thou did, for what thou didst secretly, but this I will do before all of Israel and before the sun. And you did it in secret. This is going to happen openly. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord hath put forth thy sin, and thou shalt not die. How be it? Because of this deed, thou hast given occasion to thy enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Nathan departed from his, unto his house, and the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay out upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he, he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, um, while the child was yet alive, he, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. He will then vex himself if we tell him the child's dead. But when David saw his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. David arose from the earth, washed himself, anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. And then he came to his own house, and when he required, he set bread before him and did eat. And the servants said, What thing is this that thou hast done? You fasted and wept for the child while it was alive, but when he's dead, you rose and eat. He said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, I, I, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted his wife Bathsheba, went unto her, lay with her, and she bare a son, and called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Okay. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now, all right. 
Anyway, judgment came. All of this happened because David decided to make a decision that was out of what God wanted done. He didn't go to battle. He remained behind. And then that decision led to another decision. And that decision led to another decision. And that decision led to another decision. <clears throat> Hello? Now, David did repent. And, when, and then Bathsheba bare Solomon. But there was, there was strife in David's house. Absalom. Hello? I mean, there was, there was fighting among his children. One, one killed the other. One, well, actually, I, I, one raped one of the sisters, and then he was, he was killed by one of the other brothers. I mean, it was, it was a mess. Are you here? You're going home. Okay? This child died. God, God wasn't going to bless the child of adultery and murder. Hello? Now, if we don't like talking about that side of things, you know, as, as Word of Faith people, you know, we just... We, we, we totally deny that there could ever be any judgment for sin. You know, especially now we got into the grace thing. It's so far over there that you're pre-forgiven. I mean, Nathan the prophet came in and said, David, thou art pre-forgiven. The Lord doesn't even realize you did this thing. He's going to bless that baby and make it the king of Israel. That ain't what he said. The Bible says he despised. He, he, he was displeased with what David did because it was wrong. There is justice in God. Okay, the man lost his life. The woman lost her husband because of his lust. Now, God is a God of restoration because out of Solomon comes, you know, the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon built the temple. David was not allowed to build the temple. Hello? See, David was to build the temple, but he wasn't allowed to because of the sin. It had to go into the next generation. That went over big. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're going home. See y'all tomorrow. Hallelujah. <coughs> David blew it. Yet became the greatest king of us uh, ever in Israel. Okay? Abraham! Okay, so we've got, you know, we got Saul, he messed, he, 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 uh, he made a bad decision. David absolutely made a bad decision. Abraham, do you know his decision we are still paying for today? Hello? God comes and shows up, tell him, tell him that when he's 75 years old, the Lord appears to him and says, um, you know, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And uh, your seed is going to be as the sand of the seashores, da, 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 da. And uh, Abraham's like, cool. At 75. No, at 87. Okay. About, about 87 or so. Uh, wifey comes to him and goes, look, dude, I know you said that the Lord appeared to you and told you you're going to have to see it. Uh, you're going to be as a sand of the seashores and the stars. Of that. He said, I don't see it. It ain't working with me. So go in to my handmaiden, Hagar. It may be that she bring forth a child. And Abraham said, oh, baby, I can't do that. I'm, I'm, you know, that's, that's, that's not right. That wouldn't be right. The Lord's going to honor his word. And he, it's going to be between me and you. Ain't what he said. You know what it says? He hearkened unto the voice of his wife, Sarah. I got permission. Woo! Now, let's not act like, you know, that they're walking around with halos over their head and don't have any flesh. Amen. He hearkened unto the voice of his wife, Sarah. Oh, baby, uh, that sounds like a good idea. So, you all right with this? Yeah, I'm all right with that. You sure you're all right with this? Because, you know, baby, you understand. I wouldn't want to do anything that you wouldn't be all right with. Are you all right with this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, then what happens? Abraham and Hagar go into the tent. Oh, yeah. Guess what happens? She gets pregnant. Guess what happens? She has a son. Names him Ishmael. Hello? So, at 90 and 9 years old, the Lord appears to Abraham. 
Hello? No, I'm sorry. At 86, about 86, the Lord comes and talks to him, and he says, uh, how long shall I go childless, seeing I have no one in my house? Only this one um, Eleazar, or whatever his name is, is um, born in my house. Now, he's my heir, you know, but he wasn't born, he's not mine. And God reaffirms. But then Hagar comes up with the brilliant plan. Well, let's help him out. See, we will make, get ready for this. I'm going to do like that one preacher that had been to our church before. Get ready. This is, this is deep. <laughs> like, like no one's ever heard any revelation in their whole life. Get ready. Let me come up with something you go. Thank you, Reverend Rod Serling, for joining us tonight. <laughs> yeah, wacko. Um, wacko revelation. And uh, where was I going with that? Oh, when you hearken to voices other than that of God, you're setting yourself up for failure. When God has specifically spoken something, you don't go get somebody else to give you their opinion of what God meant or a way to make that happen. If I had listened to people and their counsel, I, we wouldn't be here. We would not be sitting in our own place because I was told that the definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. If you're following what the Lord told you to do and you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's called obedience. It's not the definition of insanity. Hello? We use, that's a worldly definition. Well, if it was God, you would have been such and such place by now. Who are you to say that? By what authority do you say that? Do you have Bible for that? That when the Lord gives you a promise, it's going to happen within a certain period of time or it's not God. God has never said in all the years of ministry that on such and such date, you're going to be in this building. On such and such date, you'll have this many people. On such and such date, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. But when people come along from the outside and go, well, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm telling you, you know, something's wrong there because if it was not, if it wasn't wrong, they would be at this certain size by now. Where'd you get that from? Honestly, where'd you get that from? That's just an opinion. And you're basing that on the world's methods. Well, I know this church did such and such and then such and such time they were this big. Well, let me just say this. In some cases, there are things you don't know about. I mean, we got a friend um, that moved into an area up in Pennsylvania. And when he moved in, within months, they had close to 1,000 people. And he was with us and he was talking to me. He said, he said now, now, look. He said, we moved in there. There have been six Raymond churches that had come past, guys had come in, started churches, got it up to a certain size, and then left, and the church fell apart. He said, when we came and we stayed, and we look stable, all those people who've been in those different churches start, started showing up because that's what they were. They wanted that kind of ministry. There was just nobody there doing it because they had come and left. Okay. And so, you know, you can't base it on that. Well, if you were, if you're really hearing from God, you'll have this many people by a certain day who said so, unless the word of the Lord comes that you're going to have so many people on such and such day, then what do you do? Well, if you keep doing what you're doing and you're not getting any different result, then you're a saint. I was obedient. Now, there are times I didn't want to be obedient. There are times I thought the same thing. Man, I must have left. What in the world have I done wrong? And I had to overcome all of that. Because somebody said, what are you going to do? I said, i got to follow the same counsel I would give somebody else. Go back to the last place that you know God spoke and go there. And every time I would do that, I would go back to go to Greensboro and pastor this church. 
that same voice that told me to come here didn't tell me I could leave. Didn't tell me to leave. And didn't tell me if you'd done such and such, you'd be bigger now. Now, if he can tell me to pack up and move here, he can tell me it's time to pack up and leave here. You failed. He had to have any problem telling Saul he failed. Amen. So I don't go by people and their worldly definitions of things because they're looking at it from the natural. And on the other side of that, there's a lot of what we call successful ministry. It's nothing but flesh. It's manipulation. It's carnal. It's flesh. They've used strategies of the world and they're not really, that's not really uh, preaching the gospel as much as they're pre they're doing techniques to get bigger. I've seen it. it you know, it's show, you know, oh, so-and-so is my pastor. Okay. I've outgrown him. I'm going to connect with this bigger name TV ministry. That's my pastor now. Why? Hello, because notoriety, you can get people, oh, so-and-so's my pastor, you know, and they go, oh, I see him on TV, and they come flocking in. Amen. I've seen it happen. Watch it happen, you know, stepping stone, name calling. So I, I, I've, I've been around long enough now, I don't really care what somebody else is doing. I don't care if they're bigger, smaller, same, whatever. That's, that's between them, the Lord, and whatever. I'm going to obey God. And I don't want to hear your Mickey Mouse opinion about it. And I'm being honest now. Well, if it was the Lord, you would be bigger. I, oh, oh, shut up, Job's friend. Hello, you're just one of Job's buddies. I know it's the truth. So anyway, um, had I listened to that, I would have been gone. I had a very good friend come and tell me, you know, if, if, I, if, 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 if I had been in the church and they had done the things that happened to you, that happened, that happened to me, that's happened to you here, I'd have been gone. I'd leave. I'd go somewhere else where people loved me. Well, people loved me. It's just a lot of people didn't. And they made sure everybody knew about it. Had a guy in the church one time said, you know, he went to a gas station and this guy who used to be in our church. And the reason he didn't like, like it was, uh, he was just, you know, uh, having a good time with one of the girls in the church. Hello. And, you know, he didn't like we, we preached about that. And so he went, to, that guy came walking over to him. He had, he had stopped coming to our church. I want to tell you something about Pastor Red. And went off. Now, the, the person didn't have enough guts just to say, it's because you're living in sin, he, you know, and you didn't like it. Hello. People don't like it. You know, and then it's my fault. How can it be my fault? You know? Well, because then you can justify your actions just like David did. <coughs> Hello. All right. And so we, you don't hearken to uh, Abraham hearkened to his wife, Sarah. We've got Ishmael. We still got Ishmael seed. We still got problems over that. 2,000 years later, we're still dealing with that night in the tent. Well, actually more than 2,000, probably about oh, maybe 4,000 years uh, later. We're still dealing with that, that, that romp, rompus in the tent. Hello? Here we go. He hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarah. And now here we are in 2023, and we're still dealing with that hearkening unto the voice of his wife, Sarah. Are y'all here? So you don't hearken to the voice of people who speak contrary to what God said. That God comes back to Abraham when he's 99, and Abraham says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. The Lord said, I, heard, I hear your voice, but that's not the seed. He said, I said, it's going to come out of you and Sarah. That's my plan. Now, you offer me this other plan, and uh, that's not the plan. Mm -hmm. This is the plan. Hello. All right. In Israel, 
Now, 1 Samuel chapter 12, we, we're not going to go back there, but Israel wanted a king. We're going to stop here. And the next week we'll pick up with, we must make the right choices and how to make the right choice. Okay. Remember, Israel didn't have a king. The Lord wanted to be their king. God wanted to be their number one. God wanted to be the one that spoke and they followed after him. But Israel wanted to be like all the other nations. They wouldn't be like everybody else. We want a king. So Samuel comes to the Lord and says, what am I going to do? And the Lord says, uh, I'm, can I, I'm just going to paraphrase. Don't take it personal. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Now, therefore, go and anoint Saul to be king over Israel. What? They wanted Saul because he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. They wanted a big king. They wanted to put him on display. <coughs> they wanted to say, hey, look at your little puny king and look at our great big king. It was all show. They never got into show. Listen, church, we can't get into show. Are you here? We need to be followers of Jesus. We need to follow the Lord. We need to, we need to let the Lord be the center of our life. Amen. And so Israel got a king, and what happened? It was nothing but an up and down roller coaster. Because if the king was evil, Israel went into captivity. If the king was good, it was blessed. And then they get an evil king, and they get a good king, and they get an evil king, and they get a good king, they get an evil king, and they, they just went back and forth, back like a tennis match. Boom, 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 boom. Captivity free, captivity free, captivity free, captivity, 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 free, free, captivity, cap. Oh. And that all happened because they set up a kingdom with a monarchy. Hello. And if the king was evil and then married a harlot, I can't even think of the harlot's name right now. I went blank. Who's the woman that was the evil queen? Huh? Jezebel. Yeah, Jezebel. Now, how can I forget that? Going to the Pentecostal church, if a woman wore lipstick, she was a Jezebel. That woman right there is a Jezebel in church if I've ever seen one. Boy, did I hear that. Why? She had a lipstick. Had some makeup on her face. She had brushed her hair. <laughs> she even cut it. That woman's going to bust hell wide open. <laughs> How many Pentecostals do I have? I grew up Pentecostal. You? Well, you grew up Pentecostal, didn't you, Jerry? Oh, you, grew, you came over among the Pentecostals. Oh. Okay, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Yes. Not to be confused with Anderson, Indiana, or the Worldwide Church of God, Armstrong, Esmond. Okay, Cleveland, Tennessee, the Spirit-filled Pentecostal Church of God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jezebel. And she's going out, got her own prophets, doing her thing, and got a weenie husband. He can't, he can't control his wife. And she's running around killing off the prophets of God. Until one showed up that was anointed. Said, bring it on, dude. Let's have at it. Amen. But this is how it went. Why? Because Israel wanted a king. And they had a monarchy. And they, they, and they established a monarchical rule. King was ordained of God. You can't, can't be questioned. It has absolute authority. You go back in history and you'll find out that's how, that's how it happened with monarchies. They, they, they took that theme and it became the way they, they ruled. The European nations ruled that way. The king was ordained of God, infallible. Until they cut Louis' head off. Louis XV or whatever. Him and Marie Antoinette. The French just got into this guillotine thing, boy, and they really went after it. <laughs> they found out that thing was pretty cool. Shoo! Yep. Catch the head in the basket. Let's go with it. All right. Now, do you know the place that they were that they uh, killed 
Marie Antoinette and Louis. You know what it's called now? Place de la Concorde. The place of reconciliation. <laughs> now that's what it's called now. That's not what it was called then. But that, that's what you call Place de la Concorde. You know. The place of reconciliation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because, you know, the French Revolution went on and, you know, and they, they, they destroyed that monarchy mindset. It, it became no more. It was no longer valid. Uh, glory to God. So, don't listen. Don't hearken to the voice of the wrong one. Israel wanted the king. They got a king. It cost the, it cost the nation. Abraham hearkened to his wife, Sarah. We still have Ishmael's. David li um, uh, listened to his flesh. Bathsheba. These cost. See, when you make decisions that go contrary to what God wants, it's going to cost you. Now, that can be reconciliation. But why get the reconciliation and damage control when you don't have to go down that road in the first place? Amen? I wouldn't walk around banking on, are you here? The restorative power of God when I can just go on with the direction and leading of the Spirit of God. Now, if you've messed up, and if you do mess up, God's restorative. He can restore. But, man, why do you want to have to clean up that mess? Make the right decision to start with. And if you made the wrong one, God can, can, God can restore. But why? Don't, don't live your life, well, it don't matter because God will fix it in the end. That's the wrong, that, that, see, that's Saul. That's Saul's opinion. Well, I listened to the people instead of God because they really wanted this and I was afraid. Hoping that he could get forgiveness for it. David recognized he was wrong and asked, oh, I was wrong. Forgive me. You know, amen. And Solomon came. That was, God was, that was God's. Like that preacher said in our church one time, last time he's preached. You know, they, Bathsheba was the will of God for David. You ask me, how do I know? Solomon. I'm sitting like this. And I might still have laser burn scars on the back of my neck from the congregation going, looking for a flinch, trying to tell from how my ears wiggled. What Pastor Ed thought about that statement. I was frozen in absolute dumbfoundedness. Did he really just say that? Yeah. Solomon's not proof that Bathsheba was the will of God for David. Solomon is proof that after David repented, God restored. Hello. And listen, think of the mercy of God for Bathsheba, who was, in, in one sense of the word, power raped because of his authority and power. Not forcibly physically, but power raped. Lost her husband, then lost a child, and God restored. It wasn't just about restoring David, it was about restoring Bathsheba. Hello. And filling the emptiness of her heart of all the loss with the wisest king that ever lived. Hallelujah. So people in the Bible made bad decisions. And they, and they always did cost. There was, some, there was some price for those bad decisions. In, in, in different cases, there were uh, restorative actions by God. <clears throat> Samson. Now, Samson was, you know, I mean, he was the Rocky of the Old Testament. You know what I'm saying? Adrian! Adrian! You know, uh, I, 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 I killed 3,000, I killed 1,000 Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. <laughs> what you think about that, Delilah? <laughs> Look, I mean, you know, Victor Mature, Victor Mature would play um, Samson in the old Hollywood movie, you know, and, um, you know, Samson. Here's a Nazarene and didn't cut his hair, and his strength was lying and not cut shearing his hair. 
That was the promise of God. And Delilah would kept trying, and he would lie, and you do this, and she'd bind him up, and he ripped the ropes. And see, you keep playing around. See, he wanted her, and his family didn't want him to want her, because she was a, she was a, basically a Gentile. Let's just use that as terminology. And he wanted her because she was beautiful, and he kept he kept slipping over. He made a decision to not choose from the daughters of Israel to choose from the world. And she was an emissary of the devil. She didn't love Samson. She was an emissary of the devil to find out how to defeat the Israelis and to defeat him. And she used her charms and bewitched him and finally got him to tell her, if you cut your hair, if you you shave my hair, cut my beard, I'll lose my strength. And so while he fell asleep, got him, you know, keep drinking, and he's, he's with my babe. Your babe is an emissary of the devil. Hello? She cuts his hair, binds him up as the time passed, and goes, the Philistines be upon thee. And he jumps up to rip the bands, and nothing happens. They take him, they whip him, they beat him, they put his eyes out and put him as a beast of burden on a grist mill where he lives out all these days until they finally get, going to have this huge event at the Colosseum and they're going to bring him out to mock him because the, the champion of Israel is completely defeated. Remember, that he wished not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. But as his hair grew back, He recognized that anointing had come back in restoration. And he asked the, the uh, servant who brought him to the temple to be mocked and made fun of to put him on the two main pillars of the um, stadium. And he put him in between. And then he, that strength came. And he pushed those pillars apart and it killed 3,000 Philistines and him. Okay? I mean, it cost him his place of greatness except for God restored. He killed more in that one event than he did in his whole life before. He killed more Philistines in that one event than he did in his whole life before. So when God restored, God restored. Okay? But think about what he wouldn't have had to go through that at all if he had made the right choice. And listen to his mom and daddy. And leave that harlot alone. Okay? But she'd be looking fine, mama. I'm going to tell you like Mark Hankins, Baba did. He went out to Bible school and came back with a girl and walked in with her. And she, she looked at the girl and went, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. He kept bringing girls home, and all she kept saying was, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. He said, Mama, you just can't plead the blood over everything. She said, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and she kept, those girls kept get running off by the blood. He walked in one day with one girl and she said, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And that's Trina. They still married. <laughs> but the rest of them girls got covered in blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mama won't have it done of that. <laughs> and then he was trying to get her to shut up. Talk, quit talking about the blood. Mama, I mean, she looks good. Plead the blood. The old Pentecostals would we we used to, we used to say that all the time. I plead the blood. Didn't really even know what we were saying. We just said we plead the blood. And what you're really doing is you're pleading your case before God on the basis of the blood. Hallelujah. Basis of the blood of Jesus. You plead your case before God. It's under a blood covenant with God. But we just would say, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Hallelujah. It's, oh, there, you could say, there's power, power, wonder, work, and power. In the blood of the Lamb. We got to preach on the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew, I can take off and run with that right now. All right. Let's take up that. Guys, will y'all stop it? Y'all keep making me go longer. It's your fault. So therefore, I'm justified in doing it. <coughs> If you need an offering, I'll let it in front of you. If you're giving electronically, go ahead and do that. 
Remember, if you're sowing the capital ministries, there are going to be incidentals that they need um, once they get in country. And uh, I know they've met main budget, but if you want to continue sowing in that, you are more than welcome. And we will have that set aside. Hallelujah for that. So they can, they can take, take care of those things that happen. Glory to God. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless people as they tithe and give. Thank you that heaven's windows are open. You empty out blessings. They don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe. Hallelujah. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We want to um, let you know that we uh, love having you being with us, and we would trust that you, you've enjoyed the message. Also, we'd like to have you come out and visit us here in Pleasant Garden. Uh, we are 4.3 miles from Interstate 85 at the Elm Eugene exit, exit 124. Now, look, the city limit of Greensboro is a mile and a half from us. So we're just outside the city limit of Greensboro. Hallelujah. We are part of the Piedmont Triad Metroplex. Hallelujah. Love to have you come and join us. 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. Till we meet again, God bless you. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. And see you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad.